Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to a very special episode of Unbreaking Science. Today is 3-23-2020. My name is Dr. James Lineswiler. I'm coming to you live from the WWDNYK studios in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I uh, know the world has gone a little bit crazy, and we're going to try to keep people sane today by reviewing some ways in which we can maintain good brain health in spite of all the craziness. Britain has shut down as a nation. State by state, the United States appears to be closing down, and we hope to get some good news in the, new, in the near future as we track what's happening with coronavirus. But today we're going to take a break from coronavirus. SARS, all the science behind the virology and all that. We're going to take a break from that and we're going to discuss with an extremely special guest and uh, someone who I, I really look up to, uh, Dr. Joseph Maroon. Welcome to Unbreaking Science this evening. Thank you so much. Great to be with you. Right on. So, you know, I, I ran into you with um, a, uh, <clears throat> after years and years and years of working at the University of Pittsburgh, I ran into you through reading a review on something called immunoneuroexcitotoxicity. It was co-authored with Russell Blaylock, Dr. Russell Blaylock, and I ran into Dr. Russell Blaylock's work by all of the research that I did, the massive amount of reading in neurobiology that I did for the book on autism. But, you know, what I'd like to do is kind of take a leisurely stroll through what we understand about the ways that the brain can be harmed um, and, and what you know about it and what can people can do to better protect their brains of the, them and their children and really, you know, get into it to the point where we can, you know, people leaving the episode can feel like they have a better understanding about what Dr. Blaylock and you were talking about in your review. So um, uh, how are you faring before we get into it? Are everything okay there? Yeah, everything's great. We're doing very well. Uh, quarantine, self-quarantine for now. Uh, right. Not that I have been exposed to anything that I'm aware of, but we're doing what the rest of the people in the country are doing. Right, so it'll be interesting to see how this uh, see how this all fares. Um, what I've done is um, I brought into um, you know a, an exceptional amount of awareness in the people that follow me in terms of of what happens with the synapses when 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 they're confronted with toxins when they're confronted with environmental insults. But I want to get into your background into it and how you got into it. You're an unusual, exceptional uh, neurosurgeon, I think, in a number of important ways. And you know, I, you don't shy away from, you know, for, certainly physical injury. That's that's par for the course. But uh, nutrition and supplements and environmental factors that um, on brain health that affect brain health. So, in your is is that where does that come from with you? Is that from experience from from Reading science, research, where do you get this understanding of multivariate nature, of uh, multifactorial nature of, of brain injury? Um, that's a, a very good question. And then uh, a, lot of, a lot of neuronal synapses get connected with that. Uh, you know, there's a, a saying that good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment or poor judgment. And over the course of my career, uh, I've had some good judgment, but I also have had some poor judgment in which I And uh, beginning about 30 years ago, 35 years ago or so, uh, I had a major crisis, personal crisis, in which I lost my father prematurely at age 60 of a heart attack. Uh, my family broke up uh, in the middle of winter and I had to quit neurosurgery all the same week. And uh, I was kind of catapulted from a, uh, a, a Icarian soaring, if you would, uh, early on in my career when I was quite doing quite well and I, I plummeted into a very bad sea of depression. And the question was, how does one, how does one survive such personal catastrophic losses, a family, a father, a dog, uh, all basically in the same week? And it was really from that particular crisis, you know, the Chinese word for crisis has two meanings. 
danger and opportunity. And uh, there was a lot of danger, but it also turned out to be as adversity sometimes and not infrequently happens, uh, it turns out to be a blessing in disguise. So basically, it was at that point that I realized my life was very markedly out of balance. And uh, I was actually, I quit neurosurgery and I, I, I was unable to perform to the level I needed to. I well, let, me, let, me, let me give the people that are watching uh, some background here. You had been instrumental in um, neurotrauma, brain tumors. You used ultrasound really early on when I was a year old. You were using ultrasound to guide surgery. Um, and then you moved into using, you know, you did microvascular surgery. You were one, among the first people to use uh, CT scanning for intracranial biopsy. I mean, you were at the height of your career. And uh, what do you attri attribute the depression that you're experiencing to? Well, you, it, it gets into, you know, what's your definition of success? I was, a very, I was very successful in many ways. Yeah. I, I had accumulated titles and positions and uh, some degree of financial independence, but I neglected the most important parts of my life. Mm -hmm. I neglected my, 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 my diet, my nutrition, to some extent my family, and also uh, I, I became deficient spiritually, if you would, so that these three areas overwhelmed at the time, uh, or my work life overwhelmed the three very important areas of one's life in order to attain balance. Mm -hmm. I was very unbalanced. And when the bottom fell out, I, uh, I simply realized I could not perform my job at the University of Pittsburgh mm -hmm. like I, uh, safely. And I realized I had to leave, so I, I literally quit neurosurgery, moved in with uh, my father, left my mother a dilapidated truck stop at Dallas Pike, West Virginia. And I moved in with her and uh, was flipping hamburgers and filling up 18 wheelers for a year uh, before I was able to return to my occupation, which ended up being the most, in many ways, the most uh, fulfilling part of my profession since then. And it's that, that aspect, you know, how do you come back? And that's when you ask me about inflammation, you know, my body was toxic because my diet was horrible. I was not exercising and there was no, no spirituality. I lost my real purpose. And in terms of spirituality, we could talk about that later, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, what's, what's your purpose in life? And, uh, the purpose of life is a life of purpose. And what is that purpose? You know, how do you get to that? Mm -hmm. Well, I lost all three of them. And it's how I regained them that I'm happy to talk about that has become very instructional, not only for me, but for many other people. Yeah, I can't wait. To, I can't wait to get into that. I'm really curious. Uh, what did you uh, when did you first meet um, Dr. Blaylock? When, when did he come into your life? Russell Blaylock is another, he's a brilliant neurosurgeon, and uh, Russell and I met through the Academy of Anti, the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an annual meeting held in Las Vegas, and it's one of the largest preventive medicine societies in the world. And uh, Russell teaches courses at that meeting. They get 15,000 people, physicians, uh, mm -hmm. a year at the meetings. And Russell gave lectures on inflammation, the causes of inflammation, and how to ameliorate in inflammation. And he and I met. We, we started speaking. And uh, it was about that time in the early 2007, 2008, mm -hmm. that I became, well, I've been interested in the problem with concussion all my career. But uh, the, the problem of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is pretty 
if most people know about that, um, it, it results uh, from, it, it's not the result from traumatic brain injury mm-hmm. uh, and affected, it, it was something that uh, Bennett Amalu, a neuropathologist, uh, first published a report on Mike Webster, who was a Steeler football player. Mm-hmm. And I've been, I've been associated with the Steelers for a long time, around mm-hmm. 30 years. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I became very interested in the pathogenesis or mechanism, what causes chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Yep. And, and Russell had, as you know, published a, a book entitled Immunoexcitotoxicity. Mm-hmm. Immunoexcitotoxicity. That's right. In other words, the activation of the immune system in a deleterious way that can lead to uh, the problem of chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And, and basically, what we came up with was a hypothesis of why repeated concussions, repeated injuries to the brain can lead to a deterioration of the brain, much mm-hmm. like Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, a, a neurodegenerative process. And, mm-hmm. and basically what we hypothesized was that once, once you get repetitive blows to the head without an interval of time for the brain to heal, then you can activate systems in the brain that lead to progressive neurodegeneration. In other words, it's like a, a uh, brush fire in a, in a dry forest. And let, me, uh, let, me ask you, let me ask you a question. When in different patients with different um, types of injuries, do you see this same kind of cellular degeneration in different parts of the brain leading to different diagnoses? Yes, yes, you do. And, and what happens, if, if I may digress just a bit, so if, if an individual gets a concussion, mm-hmm. there's a process that occurs where cells in the brain called microglia get activated. It's equivalent to getting a splinter under your finger. What happens to your finger if you get a splinter under it? It gets red hot, tender, and swollen. Why? because the immune system becomes activated, exactly. The immune system becomes activated and microglia, which are kind of the white cells of the brain, get activated and release agents called cytokines, chemokines, but agents that are inflammatory. And they Mm -hmm. cause an inflammatory process to occur. So let, let's back up one. Let's back up one step for people that are new to this. So, in the brain, these microglial cells have two states. The first state is errantly sometimes referred to, I think, in, as a resting state. They're actually very active. They're they're they're, they're they help the brain develop new synaptic structures. Uh, they're very active in that process. They're amoeboid, like the white blood cells, but they also um, are there and essential in repair. So if there's tissue that gets damaged, the microglia act as the scavengers. So like the white blood cells of the of the brain, they're part of the innate immune system and they scavenge for, for the, the cell particles, the, the bits and pieces of the cells after they break up and, and they, um, uh, they, they go into this activated state. And so it, it, they're, they're, they have a dual role and, and what Dr. Um, uh, Maroon is talking about. He's talking about how when you get an injury, or a viral infection, or some other thing that makes the uh, microglia become activated, it's natural. It's uh, part of the natural kind of response of the brain. And then the 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 the, the, the problem that you intimated is that you get multiple rounds of of injury, and the cytokines that come in it induces inflama- inflammatory signaling. So, okay, take it from there, please. Yes, you, you described it extremely well. So what happens up to a point, you get this inflammatory reaction. However, if there's time, there's rest, there's, there's the appropriate nutrients, the brain goes into a regenerative mode. Right. Very, it, it, new cells are made, actually. The inflammation subsides and the brain heals. But 
if one gets, in this case of concussions, gets hit in the head before the regenerative problem kicks in, mm -hmm. then it elicits this wildfire in your brain, so to speak, which is called neuroinflammation. Mm -hmm. Inflammation of the neurons and the neural systems. And one of the greatest advances in concussion management is not allowing individuals to go back in the game, a game, before they have completely cleared in terms of their symptoms, which is the sign that the brain is healed. Right. And, and, and that's a, another digression we could talk about later in terms of the impact concussion test that we develop. Mm -hmm. But uh, so we, the brain will heal on its own if you give it time. If you impact it or have a concussion to before it's healed, you get this deterioration that can be an activation like occurs in neurodegenerative diseases, like I said, like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, mm -hmm. these diseases that we know so well. Mm -hmm. So anyway, Russell and I put the paper together, immunoexcitotoxicity as a, as a driver for chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And uh, actually for the first time explained the underlying pathogenetic mechanism of what we believe happens. Right on. So just from the abstract alone, you're talking about extensive reactive oxygen species and nitrogen species generation, accumulation of lipid peroxidation products, prostaglandin activation, which I hadn't actually heard about till I read about it from you guys, dendritic retraction, uh, retraction, synaptic injury, damage to microtubules and mitochondrial suppression. That's a lot going on. But that not that because the brain is such a magnificently complex organ? Do we have you know, the, the neurobiology is amazingly complex and, and uh, the, the actual learning process involving things like, you know, um, the learning is, is uh, snipping and, and, and pruning back of synapses as, and then re and re rebuilding as much as it is just making new connections. It's a, it's a fascinating organ. Um, I've always been fascinated by it. One of my hobbies is to wonder about the, the, the origin of consciousness from such a uh, you know, it's the largest multiprocessor computer that we have that I know of. So, well, well Jim, you thought you're you're really bringing up another point, and and that's the that goes back to Hippocrates, correction, Heraclitus, Heraclitus, mm -hmm. the Greek philosopher back in 450 BC, mm -hmm. that you can never put your foot into the same river twice. Mm -hmm. You can never put your foot into the same river twice. That is an excellent description of neuroplasticity in the brain. And what we're saying is the brain is like a flowing river in that it's constantly changing, constantly being upgraded mm -hmm. by the sensory input, the visual, olfactory, gustatory, auditory, touch, all of the sensory input that we're processing minute by minute goes into our brain and changes the synaptic connections and encodes memories and reorients fiber tracks that uh, that it, it is it's, it's absolutely remarkable so that's how the brain heals and that's how also behavior can be mo behavior can be modified and changed. So we don't have a fixed brain in that what you get early on is what you have to live with. The brain can be modified, sometimes easy, sometimes very hard to do. So, yeah, so the brings up the expression hard headed for people that don't want to learn from hard experience. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by, um, again, you know, you're, you, you, you've, the ease with which you consider and move in and out of consideration of multiple factors at the same time i think it's i think it's rare in science around injury it's 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 a it's a rarity to see it um and i, and I think it's a it's a credit to to you and to your colleagues that, that you have that flexibility 
Um, I, I, one of the questions that I thought of asking is, is do you have experience where you see people that say have one or two rounds of concussion and then other environmental factors that you pr are pretty sure are playing kind of an additive or multiplicative role in their recovery? Yes, we, we know for sure that uh, things like ADHD, uh, individuals who have attention deficit disorder uh, are more prone to have concussions and also have longer time in recovery. So that the underlying substrate of what's there in the brain before the injury can have a very significant effect in how the brain heals and, and, and subsequently how it processes information. So there are preconditions that can impede uh, recovery, particularly in concussions. Okay, so when you're um, when you're working with the team um, and somebody has uh, uh, CTE, do you, you obviously the team has nutritionists and so on. To, to, so do they go into kind of like a brain injury recovery mode uh, that that's holistic and it involves um, their diet and supplements and rest and and all the rest. So let's say that I'm on the team and I end up with this. Uh, uh, a couple of concussions. What would you tell me as a as a um, fullback on the Steelers? Well, what we have a very specific protocol that uh, has been evolving over years with the NFL, and and basically there are three things that must occur before you can go back to participating in a contact sport. Number one, you have to be completely asymptomatic, no headache, nausea, vomiting, dizziness of vestibular disturbances, completely asymptomatic. Number two, you have to be asymptomatic after a graded type of aerobic activity, mm -hmm. beginning with running, jo jogging, running, uh, and get up to the kind of sport you're participating, whether it's lacrosse, hockey, or football. Mm -hmm. Number three, you have to get back to your baseline in the impact test, which is a neurocognitive test that Mark Lovell and I devised 20 plus years ago hmm. uh, that assesses memory, uh, the ability to process information and other modalities so that all athletes now are baseline before playing a contact sport. And then if there is a concussion or a suspicion of a concussion, they have to retake the baseline test, which is a 20 minute Base, computer-based test uh, and get back to your baseline in terms of the ability of your brain to cognitively process information. Those are the three primary criteria before you can return. Uh, and, uh, and it's now pretty much the standard of care in most sports. Okay, cool. So, um, you know, you probably have no doubt advised the athletes to try to take it easy on certain things in case they get a concussion as well in a preventative manner, right? So in terms of lifestyle, there's no doubt, like, um, to, to, I don't want you to give away any of the trade secrets, why the Steelers are such a good team. But, you know, I do, with, for the general public, what are the kinds of things that they can do in terms of diet and rest and it, what are the environmental factors they can modulate in their own lives to reduce the... Um, the, the the risk if they do get a traumatic injury or if they have had a traumatic injury i'm sure the doctors tell them but this is out of a scientific curiosity that i have it because i think that we're constantly getting brain injuries all the time from one from what small ones little micro micro injuries all the time from small things that would not don't as they might be subclinical but they but the cumulative additive effect you know, might might predispose us maybe, I don't know, to uh, increased risk of Parkinson's, increased risk of Alzheimer's and so on, um, it, given other future environmental exposures. So what are some of the kind of like preventative things that people can do to avoid immunoneuroexcitotoxicity in their lives, other you know, than just getting a brain injury? Well, well, Jim, this, I have to go back to my, to the time I was living on the farm in the middle of winter in West Virginia, and as I said, working in a truck stop, I had a very significant insult to my brain, a mm -hmm. psychosocial uh, insult 
associated with pretty severe depression. Yeah. And then what happens in the brain, it's with a psychological insult, just like a physical insult. What happens is the same type of process when you are your hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, so to speak, which is their, when, when stress, neurocognitive stress affects your brain, you release various hormones. One in particular, as you're very familiar with, is cortisol, mm -hmm. epinephrine, adrenaline. And what do these hormones do to your body? Well, it, it really wrecks havoc with your vascular system. It also releases cytokines. Sure does. Just like you get with a blow to the head. And in patients with PTSD, they measure these in the spinal fluid with no trauma. And right. they see the same neuroinflammatory spots that you get with behavioral trauma as you do with physical trauma. So I, 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 tell, I mention this because when you ask what you do to rectify this, it's, it's what I found personally in my own life, what I did. I, uh, I, I was the first thing that happened to me is the, the banker who held the mortgage on the truck stop called me one day and, and said, look, you need to go for, let's go out and go for a run. It'll help you after being sequestered for three months doing nothing. I said, run, I can't even walk. Mm -hmm. uh, I get short of breath walking up the five stairs. He said, come on, let's, so we went down to the Tridelphia, West Virginia track. Somehow I made it around four times exhausted i said never again this is all for me right but that night an interesting thing happened it was the first night i slept in about three months so the next day i went down and, and i did a mile and a quarter and then a mile and a half and then three miles and pretty soon with as the unintended side effect of exercising my brain started to heal and I wanted better fuel for my body. I wanted different food. I went, instead of truck stop food, right. I wanted vegetables and fruit and, mm -hmm. and, and different things that have a much more healthy nature. I, I started taking supplements, particularly omega-3 fatty acids, <coughs> fish oil, which is an antidepressant as well as an anti-inflammatory turmeric and other agents. So when, when you say, what do you do to get better? Number one, in my, my situation, I started to exercise. Mm -hmm. Number two, I modified my diet dramatically, more of a vegetarian Mediterranean diet. Um, and uh, at the time, no alcohol, maybe a little red wine, absolutely no smoking. And, uh, and then number three, is getting back in touch with a degree of sp spirituality. Mm -hmm. I grew up, I had 12 years of Sisters of Charity in uh, parochial high schools in Bel Air, Ohio. And uh, they, uh, they, they laid down many fiber tracks in my brain about what's right, what's wrong, and, and what, what's a purposeful life. And, uh, and, and I started to get back into that, into those tracks with the diet, with the exercise. And, and I was able to get back to my work in a much, much more effective way uh, and, and an appreciative way of how fortunate I was. So these are the basic staples. There's no secret. Chuck Knoll, the former head coach of the Steelers, used to say, football is not complicated. Mm -hmm. It's very simple. It's about blocking and tackling. Mm -hmm. what, you're, what you're talking about, anti-aging, if you would, is really not complicated if you follow, like Aristotle said, the mean between extremes. Don't overindulge. Do the right things. Uh, stay within boundaries as much as you can. Modify your diet appropriately. Get enough of exercise, sunshine, vitamins, etc. So it's simple, it's just doing it that's the hard part.
Cool, cool. Thank you. That's a beautiful message. And uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, when we get to our, to, towards your book, we're gonna be able to share people with people how to access your book. We explain all this in, in great detail, including the wonderful history you shared. But uh, one of the topics that I know my listeners are not gonna let me get out of this interview alive unless we talk about it. And you guys do mention it in your review. Is you know, all things in moderation is a beautiful message, and. I've done a, a deep, deep dive over the last three years into the pediatric vaccination practices in the United States, uh, including peer-reviewed publications showing that we have repeated rounds of what appear to be what are likely toxic levels or certainly high levels of aluminum. I know that Dr. Russell Blaylock has specifically pointed the finger at at vaccines as a potential source of immunocytotoxicity. Um, and so, um, all things in moderation. Then, you know, what, do, where do you where do you stand on this? You know, um, on this issue that perhaps for some people, because they're primed, they're, for some kids, they're primed, low birth weight, poor diet, all the rest, they might not be able to handle these repeated rounds of immunoexcitotoxicity as well as others. And, you know, I'm struggling with this issue. I've been an expert in the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program. I've subsequently stepped out of the program as an expert because I find MDs that are testifying on behalf of the HHS in such a manner in which they their job is to deny that these things are happening. And so they'll find that the subtlest, tiniest little excuse to say that something that happened to a family couldn't have involved the vaccine in any way. But, um, you know, I know I know Dr. Blalock's position because he's been very vocal about it. But if, if you don't mind, if I could ask, what, what you know, where, where do you, what do you think we should, where could we go with this in terms of the, the repeated doses? I've my, my most recent peer-reviewed publication includes one that calculates that like children up to the up to the age of seven months may be in in aluminum toxicity 75 percent of their days and in the first two years they may be in aluminum toxicity one out of four days then that's because they get you know 70 72 vaccines before they're 16 or something 38 vaccines in the first two years of life um do, do, do you factor that in into your understanding here Jim, you're, I have to say, you're much more knowledgeable on that subject than I am. I, I am concerned, quite frankly, about the number of injections uh, and the number of vaccines that the kids are exposed to. Uh, you also see the measles epidemics in New York, in Oregon, in, in, uh, in, in various areas where the parents don't vaccinate the children. Mm -hmm. you know, is it, is it right to go back to allowing, like when I grew up, you know, there were no measles vaccines. Uh, and, and is it right to go back to that point? I have a hard time going that way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we sure don't want to eliminate the polio vaccine, the smallpox vaccine. Uh, the, these are crucial for the devastating effects those diseases have had. Uh, I don't know where the moderate, the, the moderation point is, uh, mm -hmm. but I, I have, you know, my 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 friends and, and relatives with kids, and and they get all of these shots in one time. Mm -hmm. I that bothers me. <laughs> Uh, yeah. But medically, I'm not an authority in that area, and I quite frankly would defer to, to you and Russell on that one. Yeah, so there's, uh, thank you for that. I understand. So, uh, Dr. Neil Miller is the only person that I know of that's looked at the vaccine injury rates um, that are reported vaccine injuries um, with respect to whether a person got one vaccine or multiple vaccines. And he says most of the morbidity and mortality is due to people getting more than one vaccine in a visit. And I'm not a medical doctor. I don't give medical advice. I look at this as a scientist, but I'm also an optimist in that, in that, you know, I, I, in this coronavirus outbreak and the Zika virus, you know, outbreak, I actually put, put, my money where my mouth is, so to speak, to actually calculate the similarities between the proteins in the vaccines, uh, or sorry, in the in the viruses for Zika and coronavirus, to try to communicate to the people that are making the vaccines. If you put these specific proteins, 
in a vaccine, they happen to match human proteins. So you probably want, in your formulation of the vaccine, you probably don't want to have a vaccine that's going to induce autoimmunity because you put a protein in it that looks just like a human protein over, you know. So my approach is to try to make vaccines safer and 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 also respect choice. So certainly when, when families have... Um, direct experience where they've seen it with their own eyes. They have, their, their child went in for a vaccine, they were never the same child thereafter. I think it's a discredit to to science and to medicine to say to them, well, it's just a correlation. Uh, you know, it's just, and, and, and I don't want to drag you into the to, to it in a big way, but I do want to say, I totally respect that you guys mentioned, you know, in your review, vaccines as a potential contributor to uh, immunoexcitotoxicity. And I think if people read immunoexcitotoxicity from a environmental standpoint, as well as an endogenous standpoint, what Dr. Maroon has said is that stress can be a source of immuno uh, neuroexcitotoxicity. And if we stop playing this either or game, we might be able to come to a more sensible position where we have an agenda, uh, pro hopefully from a, a new agenda will emerge where we say we want to do individualized medicine for immunization as well, where we look at it and say, some vaccines are for some people and some are not for the others. And we, I think we have the technology to figure that out. Um, and so, you know, I understand the deferment and I totally respect you on that. Thank you for discussing it with me. Um, so I wanted to, um, I wanted to ask the following question. There's a new field of psychiatry emerging. It's called immunopsychiatry. And it, uh, in my review of the literature in immunopsychiatry, it's bigger in Europe than it is here, but there is a, a starting here. But I don't think that it's yet found the works on immunotoxicity. They don't understand the role of glutamate yet. Glutamate keeping the microglia activated. We didn't talk about that yet. But in fact, I've gone so far, I'm so excited about immunopsychiatry. Um, psychiatry, which is exactly what you're talking about. You're talking about depression, right? You're talking about the fact that there's an environmental contributors that are big time important. Um, I got so excited about it when I learned about it. I put out a paper competition to people who have previously published in immunopsychiatry to submit a paper to a journal uh, that mentions excitotoxicity and glutamate and all these factors to try to get them to look into it and see, but we don't have any entries so far. So, let me ask you, how well accepted is immunoexcitotoxicity, immunoneuroexcitotoxicity in sports medicine and in neuromedicine in general? Is it getting out there? No, in, 19, in 1986, I, um, I, I was, it was my responsibility to give a presidential address to the Congress of Neurological Surgeons, which is the largest body of neurosurgeons at the time in North America. Yeah. And one of the topics that I went into in some detail is the new science at that time of psychoneuroimmunology. <laughs> Where did it go, Joe? Where did it go? So, <laughs> so they had it. So, I mean, this in the 80s, late 80s, 90s, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal study. In, in medicine, psycho neuro immunology. Okay. How our thoughts control and activate our nervous system that subsequently modulates the activity of our immuno of our of our immune system. Right, so the other way around. Right. So it it's really and it's so prevalent. So psycho or what did you behavioral behavioral immunology? It's called it's called um, immunopsychiatry. In, immunopsychiatry. I mean, it's basically on on based on uh, psychoneuroimmunology uh, applied to psychiatry. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I, I deal with people under stressful situations very frequently, and I see what chronic stress does. To individuals, uh, and it, it gives them heart attacks. It ages them prematurely, and as you know, ever elevated levels of cortisol associated with chronic stress 
actually is neurotoxic to the brain. Mm -hmm. It kills cells in the hippocampus, which is the primarily primary memory encoding area of the brain. And uh, it destroys your brain, chronic, chronic stress. And that's an immunological reaction, how that occurs. So how, how you manage stress, again, we know that physical activity, exercise, compared to SSRIs, the most common drug dis dispensed in the United States, yep. serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, to balance the neurotransmitters in your brain. Uh, if you compare, and it has been compared in many studies, an exercise program with a prescription of antidepressants with their complications of decreased libido, lethargy, and, and other, other, uh, other findings, chronic exercise program works much more effectively in moderate and mild depression than the billions of dollars spent on drugs. Sure. But it's much easier to take a pill rather than walk around the track or, or get your five or 10,000 steps in a day. Sure, so absolutely. That absolutely. That, that, make, that makes a lot of sense. So if let's say that I have a um, functional family situation, I end up running into something that causes immunoneuroxidotoxicity from the environment. And then I suffer psychologically from that. Uh, there's going to be a feedback loop. Will there not be? Because the way I start treating people around me might become dysfunctional as a result of the environmental impact on me. I might, if I'm an infant, I might develop differently, uh, might have problems developing, going through normal pathways of development. And then wouldn't that add to stress? Because, you know, the people that I have, one of the things that, a very profound thing that a young lady told me when I first started doing, when I was doing research for my autism book, was that autism is divorce severe autism it dramatically increases the rate of divorce and that there's stress but so there's a possibility of a feedback loop but by the same time if people are genetically predisposed to having immunoneuroexcitotoxicity that these factors might be difficult to tease apart but um certainly you've seen dysfunctional behaviors after brain injury and that sort of thing right absolutely you know i there's a great book uh, by by John Arden, a uh, a behavioral psychologist, psych psychologist uh, in the Kaiser Permanente system, uh, mm -hmm. and it's entitled "Genes, uh, Brain, and and uh, Neuroplasticity," essentially, mm -hmm. and he discusses in great detail the various systems, the operating systems of the brain. We have the executive system, which is primarily the frontal lobes and the frontal cortex. Uh, we have our salient network, which is our, uh, our pretty much our emotional network. What becomes salient, our ability to determine what's important and what's not important. And then we have the default mode network, the three network patterns that form the connectome or the wiring diagram of our brain and how each of these is impacted at different parts of our lives and, and also the predisposition that occurs uh, from our parents' experience and how this is epigenetically transmitted from generation to generation uh, and, and how abuse we know, abuse, abandonment, Parental drug use and alcoholism can have major impacts on how the salient network and the executive network of the brain develop. And then getting back to your point, if you throw in excited toxicity from aluminum, uh, as well as the abuse into those environmental factors, yeah. then the brain gets wired in a very difficult way to get unwired or get fixed. Yeah, absolutely. So you have kids who are who are programmed, literally programmed, hardwired for the rest of their lives to have aberrant behavioral disorders. Yeah. Uh, impulsivity, 
anger management, uh, interpersonal relationship disturbances that can begin very early, two, three, four years of age in terms of how the child is handled, touched, coddled, loved, protected. Hmm. So it, it's a, obviously very complex, but the, the immunology uh, of that, the, the physiology, the neurochemistry, all of these factors are operant and to be able to tease those out when you get a kid who's overly active in school or overly impulsive or anger issues, you know, how do you, how do you rewire the brain in that mm -hmm. regard? And we, we get into behavioral, cognitive psychiatry, and we get into some new areas of psychiatry. Uh, things like transcranial magnetic stimulation, uh, things like photobioradiation, non-invasive, but using energy sources applied to the prefrontal cortex of the brain externally that inhibits or disinhibits these networks that are overactive or underactive. Mm. I mean, we're, we're in a whole new world of brain surgery Hmm. without opening the skull. Yeah, so there's phototherapy and things like that that I know of. So um, do you see improvements when people try to detoxify their bodies, let's say, you know, most of my community, the um, which is probably 70, per, 70 to 75% autism families, do they, 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 they see changes in behavior when they change diet when you know they, they remove what might be allergens and they detoxify a little bit and i'm not talking about a radical detoxification but have you seen in your athletes if they try to get some toxins out of their lives do they see an improvement in recovery yeah no question but, but going back to what you just said i you know i'm i'm a i'm very very interested in the microbiome Mm -hmm. and the gut brain connection big time and we you know when you're talking about kids with autism uh as you said oftentimes there's gluten and other types of food allergies and oftentimes there have been measurements of their microbiome which as you well know uh you have two and a half to three pounds of bacteria in your gut mm -hmm. that have a profound effect on your neurochemistry and, uh, and your brain function, the so-called gut-brain connection. And in kids with autism, changing the diet, a healthier diet to enhance the, the effectiveness of the microbiome is huge. Yeah. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy is another modality that's been used in autism uh, in, in terms of hyperoxygenation of the brain. Uh, and Hyperbaric oxygen is also an anti-inflammatory. So if yeah, you're having immunocytotoxicity, yeah. you're using hyperbaric as an anti-inflammatory, and also it activates stem cells. What does that mean? It creates new brain cells. Yeah. So these modalities that have been used, we're now starting to understand the scientific basis of why they are effective. That's really cool. So yeah, I know um, there's one family that told me about their child. I won't mention their names, but um, when they put them in the hyperbaric oxygen therapy, uh, put them in the chamber, um, he felt so good. He didn't want to leave. He was, when it was when it was time for the session, he felt less pain or confusion or, or so he felt normal and he never wanted to leave it just felt so good to feel the pressure i guess uh, or sense the pressure if you can and the oxygen of course is massively powerful and ted fogarty is a close friend of mine and an ipac uh, advisory board member and and he's also talking about glutathione as an important thing in the diet for this uh, antioxidation uh, anti you know this review that you guys have written i'm going to bring it up on the screen here if you don't mind again i'm going to give people the citation here before we move on to your book aminos excitotoxicity is a central 
mechanism in chronic traumatic encephalopathy a unifying hypothesis if you want to understand what's happening in the brain when it's under assault either through physical assault or as dr maroon said from stress or from chemicals in the environment take a look at this from surgical neurology international this amazing review article um and look at the humanitarian approach that we see here dr maroon is such a kind hearted person he's shared his life experience with you to some extent but and you know we don't have any pre-arranged payment or anything like that i was just you know friends talking here but i want to bring up your book here square one a simple guide to a balanced life and you gave us a little bit of insight into this but when when did you realize that what you should do is take this experience of yours and share it out with people as a way of a way of teaching people on a healthy journey well i i became aware of it i, I mentioned to you when i in 1986 was the first time when what happened when i was living in that farmhouse i picked up a copy of a book that was given to me in high school as an award when i graduated and it was a book by William Danforth entitled I Dare You. It's a little, little book. And uh, it said, I dare you to lead a balanced life. And I'm going to tell you how. And he said, I want you to draw a square. And at the top, put work. On the other side, put family social. On the bottom, spiritual. And on the other, physical. He said, now I want you to draw a square commensurate with how much effort you put in to each side of these activities on a daily basis. Well, needless to say, when I, I did that, my square line, my work line was one flat, long line. Yep. There was no family social, there was no spiritual, and there was no physical. Mm. Uh, so my life was just work work and ego i would say ego because the driving factor there uh, was to that a, a lot and and uh like the, the title of the address i gave back then was from icarus to equanimitus and you may remember who icarus was icarus was a mythological individual who was imprisoned on the island of crete with his father and to escape, they made the father made wings of feathers and wax. But he cautioned Icarus before they flew out of the labyrinthine prison to be careful when you're soaring with the birds and you're looking down on the on the humble people below. Be careful that you don't soar too high, lest the sun's heat melt the wax and you plummet into the sea. Nor fly too low, lest the waves wet the feathers and pull you down also. It was the first story I could find of hitting the mean, as Aristotle said, between extremes of balance. How do you balance your life? Well, William Danforth came up with the square and said, here's how you balance your life. You think of each side, your work, your family, your spiritual and your physical side on a daily basis. And you make sure you touch each side in some way. So you here's your book, your and uh, yeah. and it's you you buy it now, and I think on Amazon it's much cheaper than that. So yeah, uh, cool. You can pick it up very inexpensively, but it's really the body, the soul, the brain, and yeah. in a very simple way to uh, on a daily basis determine whether you're in balance, so to speak. Yeah. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. So you, you gifted me the book and, you know, of course, Gracie, my fiance, automatically relocated it to, to Michigan. She's sometimes up there taking her, her. Otherwise, I'd have a copy of it here to hold up. But, you know, thank you again for that gift. Um, you know, you, you uh, um, have a, um, a, a very kind way of approaching these issues and you know I, i'm filled with gratitude for you to being on, on breaking science tonight is there any closing thoughts that you'd like to share how can people weather the storm with uh you know self-isolation quarantine shutting down cities not work staying out of work you know um get get, get this guy's book get dr joseph maroon's book and read it and say hey let's 
put our lives together in a new way. It changed your life, right? Profoundly so, I take it. Yeah, no question about it. I think, you know, in, in, in our society now, the, the majority of people are overworked, overcommitted, overindulged, overweight. Um, and so it leads to a condition called burnout. Yep. Burnout in which you're physically and emotionally exhausted, uh, you're intolerant, you become irritable. Uh, and, and this forced containment and quarantine is going to have a profound effect on how people interact with each other. Uh, and, and with the kids home from school, yeah. you know, this, this is a considerable stress that is going to occur. And it's very important. What, what I lacked, what I missed in my earlier days was insight into the problem. Mm -hmm. I had no real insight or appreciation into my work ethic and what I was doing to myself. So what I tell people now, every day I get in my car, I start my car up and I look at my tachometer. And you know the tachometer on a car, it, it has the, the red zone at the very tip where the RPMs are overheating the engine. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I sit there for about 30 seconds to a minute and I take my own, how fast is my engine spinning? Where am I emotionally? Where am I uh, relative to my stress level? Am I in the red zone? I was in the red zone for many, many months before I burned out in the past. Mm -hmm. But you have to think about it. If you're aware, like the Buddha say, awareness, mindfulness, you have to be mindful of where you are to make any difference in where you're going. So these are the kind of thoughts that I discuss in the book and uh, the compliments. I, I, I received some very, very gratifying responses from people uh, who have read it. And it's made a big change in getting people out to exercise more, uh, out to uh, back to their, their spiritual upbringings and also back to their family. Excellent. So Sanjay Gupta, uh, as you as you see there, uh, reviewed it, and he said it's already changed his life, which is a big thing for Sanjay to say. Yeah, it is. It totally is. So I'm I'm really grateful uh, for you sharing your message, and and uh, this has gone out and through four different ways out in social media, and through live feed. So. Um, you know, I've, I've, I get a lot of feedback, instant feedback from people, and I'm getting the messages of gratitude for your for your, your sharing your time with us. Um, get out those uh, board games. You know, if you have always wanted to teach your kid Monopoly, right? If you always wanted to teach your kid Monopoly and Square One or, you know, whatever, you know, whatever games you loved as a kid, dig them out. Bad, you know, go in the backyard and play badminton for the first time in your child's life. I bet you, you know, if you shut down the internet for a whole weekend, everybody would revolt, right? So, you know, you've got to get them off the internet, get, reduce the screen time, spend time. This is a time for American families to actually come together. We can make something really positive out of this. And if you have some healing to do as a family, what better time to do this than to, you know, do things that you wish that you always had time to do because now you have time to do it and it might not involve travel call it a staycation in fact when i first tweeted about this i said maybe what president trump should do is announce a seven-day staycation let's do that first let's not really like say okay we're going to shut this down shut let's call it a staycation everybody go home for a while all right and so i think people are trying to to deal with this their very best and um I hope that people that need this book get a, get a hold of it. One, one, one final comment. Uh, you know, this forced quarantine comes from, comes from China primarily, but if you look at the word crisis, which this is, when you write the word crisis in the Japanese language, in the Chinese language, it has mm -hmm. two meanings. Two meanings, danger and opportunity. So what you're saying is make this the opportunity 
from this very dangerous situation. Absolutely. And I, what I want to also do is help people not be afraid because, you know, you might be terrified. I don't know. Maybe there's some people absolutely terrified of spending 72 hours straight with their kids. It just might not work for some people. Some people might uh, put that down as, you know, that they're actually terror, terror, terrified by it. But, you know, uh, the come a day, I promise you, regardless of how old your child is or how close or not close you are to your spouse, there'll come a day when you wish you had time like that. If you don't want, if you don't wish that on a daily basis like I do, I wish I had my boys with me every day of the week 24 7 it's selfish of me to want that but if you don't wish it every day i guarantee you you you, you will and also um to try out dr maroon's book and uh you know you can find it at amazon support your independent bookseller if they if they're still allowed to operate i don't think they are in pennsylvania anyway but with you know try to put an order in for it and and uh get so, get it for someone who you think might might benefit from it as well and also as i am fond of saying quite often there is no quid pro quo dr maroon generously swapped his time for mine and so i want to thank you dr maroon and we'll have you back again some other day to talk about something else about neuropsychiatry, immunopsychiatry. We'll put it all together. And uh, just give me a call sometime if you ever want to talk again. I think you've got a good following here. Well, thank you, Jim. It's a great pleasure. And I appreciate it very much. Right on. Thank you. Be well. Stay very well, okay? We need guys thank like you. you. you too. All right. We're going to close out here with, uh, if I can find it here. It's a little awkward. I don't have anybody... There we go. A little bit of music here. And there we go. Hi, everyone. I'm your host, Dr. James Lyons Tyler, a.k.a. Dr. Jack. In this episode, we're going to review the evidence that science is broken. This is not a science story. Science will be told. The people will know. The price of corporate science merely taking its toll. Whistleblowers blow. Public health that are low. They say the science is settled. But how do they I'm know? Science. Ask questions, quickly think you should try it. It's pure, unadulterated science. I'm breaking science. I'm breaking science. You can't deny it. You sure can't buy it. Fact check, use your brain, don't be quiet. It's pure, unadulterated science. I'm breaking science. I'm breaking science. Using the tools of the trade to back up what we say. You can't be silent when it comes to I'm breaking science. Let's light the truth up, next level ultraviolet You've got a hypothesis, do a critical test Make an observation, without being biased Use logic and reason, mixed with evidence Look at patterns and results with significance Calculate the numbers, feel accurate Or else your findings won't be legit Don't cherry pick, but be skeptic Cause broken science it makes us sick that science is being funded by the very same people that run it so they can promote a product so they can make that money huh try not to laugh because this ain't nothing funny all these science like activities no joke they call them studies can't pick and sample groups and no true placebos losing public trust the more and more that we know the truth will be told 